today. How are you guys feeling so far? Good, good, good. Um, we appreciate everything that you all have done today, your flexibility. And I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about flexibility um, in how we present ourselves to the world. So I want to see really quickly by a show of hands, how many of you, diagnosed or not, have ADHD? Look around, you guys. <laughs> Look around, there is something magical about float therapy and ADHD. And it is something that I have seen in conversations constantly with my clients, with my friends um, in the float industry, and everybody seems to have all of these ideas and these passion projects, and sometimes it gets a little bit hard to get things done. And so if you know me, you know I'm full of ideas. I do a lot of things. Uh, I'm pretty involved in a lot within the industry because I love it. It fuels me. And sometimes it's also really, really hard to get things done because my brain is running a million miles an hour. So whenever I saw some conversations happening on Facebook with a lot of folks saying that they have ADHD themselves, I thought, you know, this is great. I'm going to go ahead and talk about that at Float Conference. And I came up with a million ideas. This is what I want to share with everybody. But... I also knew that I had some other things that I needed to do, had things that were time sensitive. And if you have ADHD, you know that there are basically two times that exist, and only two. Those are now and not now. That's it. And if you don't have ADHD and somebody that you love does, you know this because it drives you absolutely crazy. You often have to repeat yourself, hey, I asked you to do that well, yeah, but you didn't say when. Or it's something that you got super, super excited about, dropped everything that you should be doing, and just focused on that thing instead. Okay? Anybody sound familiar? Like, that's my life, too. <laughs> and I was also a project manager in my previous life, so my job was really to figure out how to get things done. And I have tried every task management app and project management app out there. Um, my husband likes to laugh at me all the time because I'm like, I got this new tool today and it's gonna solve all my problems. And it, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. But what I have learned is how my brain works. I've done a lot of self-reflection and self-study. I've read as much as I possibly can. And so what I wanna share with you today are just some tips, okay? This is not medical advice. I am not an expert on ADHD. I just get to live it with that busy, busy brain. And so we're not going to take a long time today. I'm just going to share some of the tips that I put into practice every single day. Um, if things are out of sight, they're out of mind. And then whenever you realize, oh, it's time to do that thing, if you didn't do it at the last now and now it's now, Paralysis. Paralysis hits so hard, and you know you need to do it. It's something you want to do. In fact, it might even be something like you volunteered to do, like talk about ADHD at a float conference, and all of a sudden you find yourself trying to figure out what to actually say, and there's that paralysis. Like, I can't do it. Why can't I do it? And having some kind of a practice is going to help you to get through those moments of paralysis. Um, if you think about it, ADHD, for a lot of people, they talk about how they struggle. For me, it's a superpower. I've heard several of you say the same thing. We can do some pretty amazing things with our brains, but we have to know how to work within some limits with that. Um, use that now and that not now to your advantage. And so a couple of tips. Number one, when you find yourself paralyzed, this is a little neuro hack that you can do. Um, Mel Robbins is the author, author of the five-second rule, transform your life, your work, and confidence with everyday courage. So in a nutshell, you're just going to count backwards. I like to close my eyes. Five, four, three, two, one. Move. Do it right then. And that's going to set you into a different mindset where all of a sudden you can actually do it. I use this trick a lot. If I've got a project that I've been putting off, procrastinating, because that's what we do, because it's either now or not now, 
and just doing this quick little five second backwards count. It changes something in your brain and you have the ability to then decide, I'm gonna jump up and do it or I'm not. Plain and simple. Has anybody tried the five, four, three, two, one? Yeah, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. Um, this, this neuro hack can really help to prevent all of the fear that procrastination, nerves, all of those things that tend to set in. And a lot of times that paralysis comes from the fact that we want to do something perfectly. And we can't deal with the fact that it might not be perfect. And so you kind of sit. Or it could be the opposite, where it's something that maybe you're not really that interested in. And so trying to find a way to get yourself to do what you have to do, five, four, three, two, one, go. Tiny bites. Tiny bites are a big, big thing. If you think about what you have to do in order to complete a project, you might say that I need to launch a campaign. Okay, well, what does that really mean? You've got to break it down into these smaller, actionable steps. We like instant gratification, and saying I need to launch a campaign is, or to, in my case, create a presentation, that's a big thing. Creating a presentation sounds like, all right, I can just knock that out. But in your brain, it knows there's more to it. And you know what? I'd rather be just doing something else now. And so if you change the way you think about that and you start to identify what are the steps to creating a presentation, you're going to get more instant gratification, get that little dopamine hit that a lot of us are deficient in. And so you break that into little smaller steps. Create an outline. Come up with a theme. Fine tune the tips of what we're actually going to say. Create fun little graphics around it. Make them superheroes. And then write your notes. Those are things that are more actionable than create a presentation. And so you can find that little bitty thing that you need to do. Um, when you're thinking about managing your tasks, open versus closed makes a difference. How many of you keep a binder or like a paper planner that has a book that opens and closed? Like there's a cover, okay? Several people. Do you find it's really effective? Or is it out of sight, out of mind? Because for me, I don't see it. I have to open the cover to see it. And I'm never gonna do that because I'm thinking about something else. There's some other activity that I want to be doing, and so I'm gonna procrastinate a little bit, just because I can't see it. It's that simple. So what I do instead is I have a notepad that I keep on my desk, and it's specifically made for task management, but it has on one side a list of all of your tasks. On the other side, it has the days of the week. At the top, it says top three priorities, and you can make these yourself. Very easy to make a template. You don't have to buy a notebook. But if you do it, you have to keep the printout front and center. And I come up with everything I want to do this week. And then I say, OK, task number one, I'm going to do on Monday. Task number two, I'm going to do on Tuesday. Task number three, I'm going to do on Wednesday. And assign those things. It's right there in front of you. And then all of those brilliant ideas that I come up with, I put into an online project management system. It's out of sight. It's out of my brain. I don't want to forget about it. It's probably this really, really amazing, wonderful thing that I want to deliver. And so I know that I can't focus on it now. So I put that in a system. And then once a week, I sit down and I look at my online system. I have everything loaded in there. But on Monday, I will sit down and have a one-hour planning session with myself, pull out the things that are really important for that week. And I also get to see that some of the things that I was really excited about last week I'm not so excited about it anymore. It doesn't really matter. I don't need to do that. That's a waste of my time. Or there's more now things that have come in that I really do need to address. So that's one of the hardest part, is being honest. We have these amazing ideas, and I actually bucket them in my online system as things that I must do, things that I need to do, and things that I want to do. Must do are things that are time sensitive, projects that I have, you know, clients that are uh, asking me to complete something. It could be something, you know, paying your bills on time, things like that. But be really honest. Do I want to do this? Is it actually going to make a difference or not? 
and that is really hard. <laughs> it is so hard for me to take some idea that I'm super excited about and say, yeah, but I don't really need to do that. It'd just be kind of cool, okay? So be honest with yourself. Number five is all about creating your own pressure. So ADHDers are often procrastinators, and we do amazingly well under pressure. Okay? Running small businesses, figuring out what we want to do, getting a project done at the literal last second. I may or may not have finished some slides for a presentation today at 11 o'clock last night. Maybe, maybe not. It, it was now last night, though. And so you know that you work really, really well under pressure. If you can't beat that system, you can work with it. So create your own pressure. Has anyone tried the Pomodoro technique? Yes. So Pomodoro technique is a specific time management task. If you think about what I said earlier about creating the presentation, I'm gonna break that down into tasks, and then I'm gonna do Pomodoros. So they're really easy. You get a timer. It can be a voice-activated dev device. It can be your phone, but I caution not to use your phone because we all know that the dings and the pings and the distractions are there, and that's gonna kick us. So we wanna try to avoid that. But your Pomodoro is typically 25 minutes, and then you get a five minute break. So you get a little reward at the end of that. You get to check box what it was, but you only work for 25 minutes. And then you have to take a break. And then if that task isn't completed, you do another Pomodoro. And the idea is that you run through four cycles, and then you can take a longer break and actually rest. And in doing this, you know you can't do a whole project in 25 minutes. So it kind of forces you to break it down. It also creates a deadline. You have 25 minutes. And how disappointing is it to get to the end of that 25 minutes and you haven't finished it? And then you're gonna start to beat yourself up for that. But if you can start to just really stay focused, keep your email closed, mute your phone, whatever you need to do to eliminate additional distractions and just focus on getting it done. It gives you that dopamine hit whenever you actually get it all finished. Tip number six. This one is so hard for me to under-promise and over-deliver. One thing that most ADHDers do is vastly underestimate the amount of time it takes to do something, especially if we love it. We get into hyper-focus mode and can't break it. I actually have to schedule reminders on my Alexa device to take a break, to go to the restroom, <laughs> to take a drink of water, because I'm so tuned into what I'm doing. It can be really, really intense to get into that zone, but to me, what I think just took me an hour, I've been working on it for seven hours. And there can be some really gross mis- understand or miss estimates on how long it actually takes you to do something. So I time track everything in my life, everything. I log how long it takes me to do just about anything you can imagine. I log how long it, you know, I spend um, working on the podcast. I log how long it takes me to respond to emails. And then at some point, I don't always have to do that. Once I've done it enough to figure out how long something takes me, I don't have to keep recording that time anymore because I know. And I can then use that because I've, st I've created this baseline. This task always takes me three hours. Then I know that I can break it down into tasks and the next time that comes up again, I can better estimate and say that it's gonna take me three hours. But if somebody else is waiting on it, I'm gonna tell them it takes me six. And that way I can hopefully beat that and I'm not beating myself up though because I've overpromised something that I can't deliver. So as much as possible, cut it all in half, okay? Cut everything in half in what you're planning. Number seven, delegation. Delegation can sometimes be hard for us as small business owners. We wanna do a lot, a lot of us are DIYers. We really enjoy doing some of the stuff. And so when you think about delegating, the things that don't bring you joy should be top on your list. If you really struggle and you find yourself procrastinating every single month or every single week or however often it is, your, your paralysis is going to set in. But there's somebody else in the world who loves to do that. Delegate it. 
It might be somebody on your team who can help you with those things. It might be hiring a professional to take over a specific aspect of your business. But delegate anything that doesn't bring you joy. Your brain will thank you. It's one of the best decisions that we made. Immediately when we opened our float center, I knew I didn't want to do bookkeeping. I can. I have the skills. I have the knowledge. I hate it. And every time everything would come up, my reminders to lo load in my receipts, I would just freeze. Like, oh, there's other stuff. You know what? I've got this other shiny project I want to work on. And it became a not now. And then it became a never. So delegating. Number eight, schedule it. So I mentioned earlier about that task list. And just using a task list, you're very likely going to have tasks at the end of the day or at the end of the way or end of the week that are still unfinished. So instead of using a task list, schedule it. You know how long it's going to take now. You're going to run a Pomodoro, and you can schedule it on Tuesday at noon, I'm going to do this particular thing. Put it in your calendar. If it's a priority, prioritize it. If it's important to you to spend time with your family, if it's important to you to float, those are things, too, to put in your calendar. And if you say that health and wellness is a priority to you and you don't have it blocked anywhere in your calendar, it's not a priority. It's an item on your never-ending task list that you never get to. So find a way to schedule it. Whatever it is, if it's important to you, figure out how long it's going to take and put it on the calendar. When you're doing that, you might find that there are some tasks that really only take you five minutes. So you don't need to run through a full 25-minute Pomodoro. But what you can do is batch them. If you think about being a superhero, you're probably going to save everybody in the same building before you run over to the next building or to the next street, okay? This superhero power is to group like things together. If you need to make a bunch of phone calls to vendors, you can do all of those at once, okay? So your scheduled task is call X, Y, and Z vendors. And be specific, don't just say call vendors. We know that doesn't work. Be specific, give yourself that list that you're gonna call all of your vendors on this day. If you need to order a bunch of supplies, don't just hop on and order you know, one round of supplies at a certain vendor. Batch them together, and every Friday at 3 p.m., you're gonna order all of your supplies for the next month, okay? Or for the next week, whatever it is. It's a lot easier for you to kind of group those um, items and use your time wisely that way. <sighs> Most importantly, number 10 is my absolute favorite, is to float. When our brains are constantly churning with ideas, when we have a million things we want to do, and we have a hard time focusing, finding that silence is magical. And that's one of my superpowers, is to float. I try to float every week. There are some weeks that I don't, because I have another priority. I want to go spend that time with my family instead. But almost every single Sunday, I hop in the tank. It's, that's going to be one of your saving graces, and if your brain is anything like mine, you hop in, and the first 10, 20, sometimes even 30 minutes, you're <sighs> and trying to get to that place where you can be quiet. And when you're in that theta zone, you all know that that's where your brain is going to do some really deep work. It's going to help you to figure out what is a real priority, what is just something that I want to do, and I've convinced myself that I have to do, and then I start to beat myself up if I don't do it. So go float. Thank you.